Most people are likely familiar with the concept of using scent to become more appealing to others. This may be in a fairly general sense, but it is often in a romantic context. The prevalence and success of this overall strategy may be easily demonstrated by the size and financial wherewithal of the perfume and cologne industry. As it turns out, this behavior is by no means unique to humans. A great many forms of animal life employ pheromones as a part of courtship. However, the more common case is creatures producing the requisite chemicals using their own physiological processes. It is somewhat rarer to see creatures obtaining their desired scent from elsewhere, yet we do see this in a few cases. One case of particular interest is the orchid bees in the tribe Euglossini. These bees are mainly found in the tropics of South and Central America, though one species, Euglossa dilemma, has recently found its way into Florida. The scientific name for the orchid bees translates roughly into true tongue or proper tongue. A fair name, since these bees are known to have remarkably long mouthparts, which may extend to twice the length of the body in some species. Another trait that sets them apart from most other bees is the vibrant metallic colors found in the majority of Euglossine species. This, combined with a relative scarcity of the dense body hairs found in most bees, make them look a bit like living jewels. Metallic green is the most common sort of color in this group, but different species may exhibit shades of blue or violet or red or even copper or gold. Some species are one uniform color, while others are patterned with varying hues. Then there are other species, particularly in the genus Ulema, that lack the metallic colors of their close relatives. Instead, they have an appearance rather reminiscent of bumblebees. While the orchid bees are fairly close relatives to bumblebees and honeybees, they are not especially social. Instead, they nest in a solitary manner, with limited collaboration among females at the very most. In fact, there are a great many sorts of bee that are solitary. Less than 5% of all bee species are properly eusocial. Before proceeding further, it might be wise to address the basic difference between bees and wasps. While there is a great deal of variety within each of these two groups, there is one morphological trait that is pretty reliable for distinguishing them. The hairs found on bees have microscopic branches, while those on wasps do not. Alas, this does little good for casual observations in the field, but it is still an important difference. This one structural difference reflects a very basic difference in diet. Wasps are carnivorous. They obtain their protein from flesh. Usually, this flesh comes from other insects. However, I have seen wasps occasionally go after more ambitious sources. I recall one occasion when a yellow jacket descended on a hamburger I was in the process of eating. The intrepid little creature simply landed on the burger as I was holding it. Thankfully, its focus was not on me at the time. I watched as it used its mandibles to slice away a small chunk of ground beef. It then clutched the prize in its legs and flew off, somewhat clumsily given the added weight. Fortunately, the little beastie was more interested in a meal than it was in starting trouble, so I was not stung on that particular occasion. In contrast to wasps, bees obtain their protein from an altogether different source. They collect pollen grains. The branched body hairs are excellent for picking up these pollen grains, and certain bee groups have specialized structures for carrying bundles of compressed pollen. As may be expected, this puts bees of all sorts firmly among the pollinating insects. At the risk of oversimplifying, bees may be said to be specialized wasps that turned vegetarian and took on a diet of pollen as a sort of meat substitute. Perhaps because of this, bees in general tend to be somewhat less aggressive than wasps. Nevertheless, many species will still sting when sufficiently provoked, and it is unwise to be careless with any of them. Of course, there is more to pollination than pollen alone. Flight muscles require a fair amount of energy to keep the bees aloft, so nectar is another vital component of their diet. 
a component that is easy enough to collect as they are visiting flowers in any case. It is much the same for the orchid bees, and the females in particular. They collect nectar and pollen for sustenance and for their larvae. In females, the tibia of each hind leg is expanded into a corbicula, more commonly known as a pollen basket. This is the same sort of structure found on the legs of female bumblebees and honeybee workers. The word corbicula pretty much translates into little basket, and it happens to also be the name of a genus of clams. Where bees are concerned, the corbicula essentially consists of a smooth depression on the side of the hind leg tibia surrounded by sturdy hairs. Collected pollen is pressed into this structure for transport. The female orchid bees also use this structure for collecting certain plant resins, which they use while constructing their nests. As an interesting little aside, the female orchid bees in the genera Exeret and Aglae do not make their own nests. Instead, they sneakily lay their eggs in the nests of other orchid bees in a form of kleptoparasitism. Roughly translated, this is parasitism by theft. This general strategy is seen in a number of other species, even among the bees. The cuckoo bees, for example, consist of various species from multiple bee lineages that are unable to collect pollen themselves. They survive by laying their eggs in the nests of closely related species, unobserved if possible. Male orchid bees may also collect their required foodstuffs as they visit various flowers, but they are often on a different sort of errand. There are a number of rather distinctive orchid species that are exclusively visited by these iridescent little gents. These orchids, most of which are in the subtribes Stanhopini and Catacetini, do not produce nectar. Instead, they produce an altogether different reward for their pollinators. One of the distinguishing features of male orchid bees can be readily seen on their hind legs. Instead of a corbicula, there is a sunken pore leading into a spongy internal chamber. This chamber is large enough that the tibia of each hind leg appears almost pathologically swollen. Rather than pollen or resin, the males use this chamber to store perfume. In fact, this structure is only a part of the male's unique collection apparatus. The front legs have brushes specialized for mopping up the scented fluids from the orchids. These brushes are then rubbed against combs found on the middle legs, transferring the scent. Finally, the middle legs are brought back and these combs are pressed into grooves above the pores on the hind legs. The volatile chemicals are squeezed into the grooves and find their way down into the spongy storage chambers. Meanwhile, as the male is collecting this fragrant reward, the orchid employs various mechanisms to secure a clump of pollen onto his body. This mass of aggregated pollen grains, known as a pollinium, is commonly seen in various orchid species. Effectively, the entire clump is transferred from flower to flower, rather than the somewhat more haphazard transfer of individual pollen grains. It is worth noting that male orchid bees do not confine their visits to orchids alone. Each species tends to seek out a variety of flowers, as well as other potential scent sources. Rotting fruit and exuded plant resins are among these sources, but there is one especially unusual case. The species Euphrasia purpurata has been observed collecting insecticides, specifically aldrin and DDT, without suffering any apparent harm. Regardless of the sources, no matter how odd, the bees collect the various pungent fluids and effectively brew a combination of odors together in their hind legs. Given their scent-seeking behaviors, it is perhaps unsurprising that these bees can be drawn in by scraps of paper soaked in various synthetic scent molecules. Precise results depend upon the scent used, the bee species, and even the time of year. As with the natural odors the bees collect, most of these synthetic scents are relatively pleasant to humans, although a few are decidedly less so. Still, the bees are not especially concerned with what humans find to be pleasant. What matters here is what the female orchid bees think of their concoctions of gathered perfume. Once they have obtained what they were looking for, the male bees gather in specific locations within the forest understory. These gatherings of males are seen in a number of animal species, and they are commonly known as leks. 
The behavior itself is sometimes known as lecking behavior. The basic idea is, a bunch of males get together and show off in various ways to attract females. In the case of orchid bees, it is a display of perfume. It would seem that the female orchid bees are not especially attracted to scents per se. They appear uninterested in paper strips soaked in the various volatiles. However, they are apparently attracted to males that have collected a suitable combination of scents. Theoretically, it would take a fairly competent male to gather and concoct a properly impressive fragrance. After all, they need to visit quite a few various flowers scattered throughout the forest without getting eaten or suffering some other sort of mishap along the way. Bear in mind that, since the sting found in bees and wasps is derived from female egg-laying structures, all of the males lack this particular defensive measure. So in this case, an attractive perfume is an indicator of good genetics. Or, to put it another way, any guy that can scrape this much stink together has to be pretty impressive. Certainly good enough to serve as a father to future offspring, anyway. Perhaps this diminishes the romance a little, but really it isn't all that different with humans. We may well be motivated by loftier ideals of love and devotion, but there is still an underlying component of rather ruthless evaluation. Granted, humans are defined by our acquired ideas as well as our inherent genetics. Still, we tend to be attracted to traits and qualities that indicate a successful combination of genetics and ideas. I could go on, but honestly, the entire topic of human romance is convoluted and tiresome. We are complicated creatures, and as such, there is ample room for bizarre contradictions and absurd scenarios. The orchid bees have a reasonably straightforward approach to finding love, at least compared to humanity. All the more reason to appreciate their unique charm. Thank you for listening. I hope you have enjoyed this brief glimpse into the more unusual side of the natural world. If you wish to know more, here are a few things that might be worth looking into. If you found this enjoyable, feel free to leave a like. If you think others would enjoy this content, by all means, share. If you have something to say or ask about, honest comments are always welcome. If you wish to see more from this channel, a subscription would be most helpful. Until next time.